Welcome, everyone. Hope that the Mindful Moments was as helpful for you as it's been helpful for us each day. We are at day three. Some people's favorite day, those who've been working tirelessly to do the conference, but maybe for some of you disappointing because we're coming to the end of the conference, not of the work. And what we thought we would do today in our plenary is sort of look at this from this from the viewpoint of how are we making sure we're reaching all the sectors of our early childhood system. So I'm super excited uh, to be a part of this plenary and help facilitate it. No slides, we're just gonna talk with some friends. Uh, I'm Neil Horn, I'm the Director of Early Childhood at Georgetown and the PI of the Center of Excellence, which means I work for Lauren Rabinowitz and, and Catherine. So I'm super excited. I asked some friends to come and speak with us and we're just gonna have a conversation and uh, also have a conversation with you. So what we will do is we will spend a little time doing introductions. You'll get a sense of who's here. We'll then do um, a little piece in the chat where you'll tell us what's happening for all of you. We'll do a little bit more discussion, some Q&A, a little bit more discussion, Q&A. So a lot of back and forth, serve and return with, with all of you on, on day three. Um, if it doesn't go well, I brought my glasses, so it looks like I know what I'm talking about, just in case I won't wear them yet. But we're going to start. I'll call on each of our uh, esteemed colleagues here and in ask them to do an introduction. But in your introduction, maybe you could talk just a little bit about what, where are you in terms of the work? What's happening? Where are you doing this work of mental health consultation? So I'll start with my friend, Deborah Chalmers. And uh, if you wouldn't mind ever coming off a of mute and just uh, sharing with everyone uh, where you are, what's happening and, and what's the work that you're involved in. So I am in Chicago. Uh, I am with Illinois Action for Children. I am the director of Infant Early Child and Mental Health Consultation. And before I go any further, I would be remiss if I did not do land acknowledgements because Chicago is situated on the land of the three council of three, I'm sorry, on the council of three fires, Ojibwe, Odinawa, and Potawatomi nations. And I myself have Blackfoot lineage in my own ancestry. And so I wanted to pay honor to uh, my brothers and sisters. Uh, as I was as I was saying, I am with uh, Illinois Action for Children. Uh, we have a small team. Um, there's about, oh, I would say uh, 15 consultants. Um, we are unique, I would like to say. Um, we provide uh, mental health consultation uh, in a collaboration with uh, Caregiver Connections, which is a statewide consultation project. Um, we also provide mental health consultation to our early learning program, uh, Head Start, Early Head Start. Um, we have an opportunity to also provide mental health consultation to uh, those community-based child cares that receive uh, funding from the Illinois State Board of Education through uh, through preschool for all expansion. Um, and we also are in school districts. Uh, we cover the county, both city and suburbs. Um, and so we are a mighty, phenomenal group of folk. Um, and I have the opportunity of co-managing this team with two great program managers. Um, and so right now, as you know, Chicago being what it is, uh, we are dealing with a variety of issues um, throughout the city itself. Um, Chicago, I would say, is like the tale of two cities. Uh, on the one side of the city, you have, uh, there's much resource, uh, much uh, uh, opportunity and, and, and much ways to link um, into resources. And then on another side of the city where there are resource deserts. And so this is some of what our consultants are faced with as they're providing consultation. Great. And I think you've already, Deborah, sort of laid out challenge-wise mm -hmm. and equity-wise sort of the, the concept of resource desert. And, and I'd like to come back to that as we're, as we're uh, talking mm -hmm. this morning. So I'm going to move next to my friend, uh, Dr. Nikki Edge, if that's okay. 
uh, and have you do a, a, a bit of an introduction. Good morning. I'm Nikki Edge. Um, I'm in Little Rock, Arkansas. I am at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences and the Department of Family and Preventive Medicine. And uh, next spring will mark my what, two decades of working in mental health consultation. Um, and I'll tell you hopefully a little bit of that history um, as we as we go on today. Um, we work in early care and education. Um, we have a team called Project Play, and we uh, support any licensed child care in Arkansas. And our work today primarily um, revol revolves around supporting our state's expulsion prevention program, which I'll tell you a little bit more about as, as we go on with our time together. Um, we have a team of about 10 um, and we're staffed through partnerships with our community mental health centers. And then we cover gaps in the state with the small but mighty traveling team of UAMS employees. I bet some of them are, are on the meeting today. Um, they are amazing. Um, so yeah, that's me. Great. And I appreciate Nikki, uh, the sort of, uh, foreshadowing of there's more to the story in terms of what's happening in Arkansas. I think Deborah's saying for you uh, in, in Illinois around mm -hmm. other places where mental health consultations happening and things like that. The light has come on in, in Dallas Rabig's. Oh, no, nope, it's back out. Yeah, we're good. So I'm going to go to Dallas next, if that's okay. Uh, and then we'll save Mary Margaret for, for our cleanup. Uh, the, the best for last. <laughs> I am Dallas Raybig, and I'm the Director of Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health Programming at the Alabama Department of Early Childhood Education in partnership with the Alabama Department of Mental Health. And we work together collaboratively. Uh, we have been working collaboratively to establish a, an infant and early childhood mental health system of care in the state, which includes mental health consultation. And that's kind of where it all started anyway, to begin with. We have three teams of, with throughout the state, there are three teams of mental health consultants serving different areas. So we have a small team um, in the northern part of the state that serves Head Start. We have a team through Alabama Partnership for Children that serves licensed early care centers across the state. I think there are there are eight <laughs> of those consultants. I'm, I'm losing count at this point. And then through the Department of Mental Health, there are eight mental health consultants that serve uh, our state funded pre-K, which is first class pre-K. But they're also serving early intervention. They we have piloted through the PATHS program um, and we have started pilots in uh, women's special substance use disorder centers. And we will now, our next venture is to pilot uh, mental health consultation in our established family court systems with the help of our safe baby friends to help guide us in helping us fill those gaps that are much needed in those family courts. Um, we've been at it since 2015, I think, and uh, we're rocking and rolling and right. see challenges as opportunities. So, yeah. Great, great. That's a good segue to me, challenge going to Mar Mary Margaret opportunity. But I love the way you described it already, Dallas, as ventures, right? I think that a lot of the work, as you all will hear today from 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 folks here, there there are ventures, and maybe some of those ventures worked, and some didn't. and And we're going to talk a bit about why you chose to go on that venture versus another one in in a bit here. But I want to turn it over to to my friend, Dr. Mary Margaret Gleason. Hi, I'm honored to be part of this group. Uh, I'm Mary Margaret Gleason. I'm a pedi pediatrician and child and adolescent psychiatrist in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, and uh, the my official role is is leading the academic program at Eastern Children uh, Eastern Virginia Medical School. Uh, I'm 
in an area that is, I think, so uh, ripe for blooming and growing and infant and early childhood mental health, um, I came here because the hospital decided to truly invest in young children and children's mental health, including young children's. Um, and so I'm part of a major expansion at, at the hospital. And one of those elements that we've been able to get funded is early childhood mental health consultation and pediatric primary care, starting with me, uh, uh, a half day a week, beginning in March of 2020, which, you know, if you're starting something new, that's really the time to do it. Uh, <laughs> um, and now we've grown to have a, a team that, that I work with, and I'm really honored to uh, share this work with, uh, including peer navigators, uh, an LCSW, and a, a psychologist. Um, the reason I'm excited about this place being in Virginia, and particularly in southeastern Virginia, um, we're also part of statewide consultation to pediatric primary care clinicians through um, a mental health consultation program that I'll, I can talk about later. Um, and the state has also invested in infant and early childhood mental health in consultation in early care and education. So this is a I'm in a place that is really putting the pieces together in ways that are um, exciting, and I'm happy to happy to tell you all about the, the journey later. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Mary Margaret. Um, I probably should have asked you guys in the beginning if I can use your first names, but because I have no manners, I've already started. So hold on. Is it okay if I just use your first names? Okay, good. Uh, so um, great. Super helpful. And I love sort of each of the pieces that you've already thrown out for folks to start to think about in terms of, as you just said, Mary Margaret, What's the state doing? So you have sort of programs, some of you working at state level, some of you working within system as part of the state, but also those connections that you've made, connections that have been harder to make. We're gonna to come to that. But um, when we were planning this, I'd like to make believe that I was in charge, but really I just said, hey, what do you think? And, and folks here sort of came up with, with great ideas. We thought in order to make this a bit more interactive, we'd now turn to all of you. I know there's like 6,000 people on, I think that's what Lauren said. But if in the chat, you can sort of share with us, where are you doing mental health consultation? In what parts of your early childhood system is it happening? Is it in, and you heard in those introductions, a lot happening in, in early care and education, in child care, Head Start, early Head Start, but also some other places. So in the chat, if you can, put where you're, already working in terms of mental health consultation. Maybe even put where we'd like to, but we've struggled. We're gonna let you take a couple of minutes while you do that to fill in the chat. Um, and then I'll sort of read a few of the highlights just so the folks on the panel here can sort of hear that. Um, where are you doing mental health consultation? Where would you like to be doing mental health consultation? So child protection, great. So folks, just be thinking about in your world, where is that sort of, wow, well, yeah, of course we're doing that. That's actually great. That's exactly what we're doing. Or no, we haven't really. Um, tribal home visiting programs, early child care centers. I see home visiting a couple of times here, right? So this is, this is helpful for our panel to start to think about as they think about um, where they've experienced their success, where those pilots or ventures, as Dallas mentioned, um, meeting with parents through uh, the workplace, preschools, folks who are actually trying to move into elementary schools. That's an interesting sort of right as as um, as we heard uh, Dallas talk about in the state funded pre-K, is there then movement to go in and up grade levels in, in elementary schools? Child care facilities that are struggling. Ah, and the QRIS system, safety net clinics, women's treatment facility working with moms and their children. So these are good examples. Keep them coming. Safe baby court teams. Everybody's dream is to have a safe baby court team. Do any of you, Nikki, Mary Margaret, Deborah, De you're working? Is Are your mental health consultants working? Oh, wait, I don't want to ruin the surprise. All right, don't tell me yet. early intervention, infant mental health, pre-K, preschool special ed, right? So we heard early intervention, some of the work that is happening in Alabama, pediatric clinics. So this is, this is exactly what we wanted to sort of focus on here. Um, as many of you know, 
uh, when I do my long, boring history lesson. And I start with the first meeting I ever went to was before they wrote the Green Book. So if you don't know what the Green Book is, good. That means that you're probably not on Facebook and you're young and you're enjoying your life. You're not like me. But the Green Book was really one of our first things. But historically, a lot of this work happened in early care and education. So to see folks putting in things like in the home, um, working with local doulas, that was that's the hope is to work with local doulas. That was inspired by this conference. God, if we had like swag, if we had COE sweatshirts, that person should get a sweatshirt, Lauren. So I don't know if you're just going to send them one of your own sweatshirts because we don't actually have any swag, but just on it. Thank you, Lauren. I appreciate that. Great. These are great examples. Really appreciate folks sharing the kinds of places that you're doing this work, the kinds of places that you'd like to be doing this work, right? Preschools and with health solutions in Pueblo, Colorado. Awesome. Statewide home visiting programs, healthy families. Family resource centers, home-based child care, mental health agent, community, local community mental health agency. All right. So I think we've got sort of the breath. I'm not sure if there's any there um, that we haven't sort of heard or that are like, wow, I didn't even know that that was a thing that existed. But I, if you keep coming, keep putting it in the chat. We're going to come back. We're going to do a little talking more here with our with our panel. And then we're going to come back to y'all for, for more questions and answers. Sorry about that. I get all choked up when Lauren gives away stuff. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more with our panel. And what I'd like to do is sort of start with a very broad question. And I want you all to sort of jump in as you see fit. And maybe, it, you know, you can sort of riff off of one another. But it, it it's in some ways a simple question and some ways not such a simple question about how did this all start? And for some of you, you were there at the start. Some of you were starting it, Mary Margaret, sort of talking about coming in and starting something about uh, two years ago or three years ago. So just want to talk a little bit with you about how this started in, in the state that you're in. Um, are you doing work in the place that you started? So did you all start in early care and education or did you just get it a start somewhere else and then expand and and maybe just a little background on on how you got to do that work in in those various places? So I don't know who would like to start. I I know you're all polite. You're unlike me, so you're probably just going to wait. But if somebody has some strong sense of where to start, fire up. I love a good origin story, so I can jump in. Uh, take us through a two minute journey through two decades, maybe. Um, so you can take it, here, you here in Arkansas, we started in 2004. We didn't know to call it mental health consultation. We called it like the Community Mental Health Partnership Project with Child Care, which just rolls off the tongue so well. Um, but we knew we wanted to partner our community mental health centers with our early care and education programs for the purpose of building teacher skills to support children's social and emotional development. Um, and so we had some three regional pilots uh, kind of in the beginning, and then um, we're closely like watching what was happening around the nation. And a couple of years later, the Johnston and Brenneman book came out and we were like, oh, this is us. This is, this is what, what we're doing. Um, and so we learned a lot from both the national research and from our research here in Arkansas about kind of what would work here in Arkansas. Um, and I started out as the evaluation partner. But since I can't keep my nose out of trying to create a more cohesive program, you know, guided by program evaluation, um, got to take um, o over uh, project management in 2011 when the state was ready to say, OK, we've these pilots were so helpful to help us clarify what would work here. Let's kind of create a more cohesive model and roll that out. So that happened in 2011, but we were still a really small program and not truly statewide. And so we had to work with our state partners and our funder at the Division of Child Care and Early Childhood Education to decide how we would create the biggest impact. And so at that time, we decided that we knew we wanted to support kids that needed us the most. And so we entered into a really exciting partnership with Child Welfare to focus on supporting early care and education programs where children in foster care were naturally clustering. 
10 children, 20 children, 30 children sort of naturally finding their way to the same child care program and those teachers really needing to be equipped um, to meet their needs. And so those programs got priority services from us for several years. We were nervous. We had primarily been in our Head Start and state pre-K systems and our pilots. These were less resource programs. They were, many of them, not quality rated or at the kind of initial levels of our rating system. So we did a lot of evaluation work to affirm that this model would still work in these circumstances. And we're like, you know, super relieved, to be honest, um, when the results were, were positive. And we loved that work. And then in 2015, we kind of evolved into our next phase. Our um, state uh, Department of Human Services Division of Child Care decided it was the, the time was right for a bigger push on expulsion prevention. Um, and we were fortunate to be able to be part of a team that's, you know, that kind of is working together to provide solutions and that we have great technical assistance partners and great partners at, at our state agencies that are also part of that team. Um, it really changed the nature of our work. We were almost exclusively doing programmatic and classroom consultation up to that point. The, the need in Arkansas took us almost exclusively into the child-focused consultation realm um, with really challenging cases. 80% of our kids screen in the clinical range on um, standardized measures of kids' emotions and behaviors. These are kids with um, strong experiences of trauma, often multi-system involved already. Um, it's been incredibly rewarding work for us. Um, and so that is kind of the bulk of what we're doing these days is supporting our expulsion prevention system and working across all kinds of um, licensed childcare in Arkansas. And so, I feel like our journey shows that even in just one sector, what I love about mental health consultation is it's so adaptable and flexible and can meet different needs and different goals that the state has at different times and that there's a lot of benefit to staying flexible and kind of going where that energy is to create kind of bigger, bigger change. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it, Nikki. I'm going to give you guys just a minute to fight over who's going to go next. But I, I do want to point out a couple of things that I think folks would probably want to hear more about. One is sort of that eval piece. And we can come back to this because I want all of you to think about the measures you were using, how you were mm -hmm. using the, the data to maybe drive some of the taking advantage of opportunity. Um, I think the other part that really struck me, Nikki, is, and I think it's important because we have so many folks around the country, not just in this conference, but that we hear about, who are just trying. You have three pilot programs. I know uh, Deb Perry from our shop did something similar with folks in Maryland. Like, I, I think it's important to hear, like, Arkansas has been doing this for a really long time, and they started just like everybody else, just trying to figure it out. So I think that's really important for folks to hear from you as the leader of a very well-established uh, program that it wasn't like somebody just handed you a big pile of cash, Donald Ducks, you know, Scrooge McDuck style and said, go, like you had to prove it using your data. So super helpful. I appreciate that, that start and that intro. So no pressure on the rest of you, but top that. Who wants to go next? <laughs> I'll go next. Thank you, Deborah. No, I'm not trying to top that. No, I'm just of telling I'm just, my story. We're all so, <laughs> so when I, when I came into the position, um, they had uh, uh, Illinois Action for Children had had um, this collaborative relationship with Caregiver Connections. Uh, I would say maybe uh, you know eight years prior to my coming into the position, um, and once inside the position. Um, we had the opportunity to expand more. Um, at that time in which I came in, we were also becoming a Head Start grantee. And so to that end, it only made sense that we would provide a consultant for that position. So we were able to, to bring on another consultant um, to work with our early learning program. Well, as time went on and COVID hit, um, we then experienced this opportunity to expand uh, early childhood mental health consultation in the state itself through GEARS and CARES funding. And so our team was able to double in size. Um, and with that ability to expand, of, expand, 
of expansion, providing more um, mental health services to more families, more child cares, more family child care homes. Um, as well as on the early learning side, we were able to uh, bring on another consultant to meet our um, ISBE contracted uh, community-based um, centers that uh, qualify for PA, PFAE funding. Um, and then um, along uh, around that time, well, prior, I'm sorry, prior to the pandemic, um, on the early learning side, our former uh, VP of early learning had, you know, he had his pulse on the public school system. And so he realized there was a need. And at that point, we decided to be daring and have an adventure and move into um, public schools, um, providing this level of consultation um, to the preschool programming. So as a result of COVID and that, that funding, um, this, you know, this, this new vision of how can we provide the services even in school districts um, allowed us to have that level of expansion, um, as well as um, due to COVID and that funding, um, there was an overall expansion in the state of Illinois period. Um, we launched um, a pilot around a consultative process, uh, which is called the Illinois model. Um, um, from that, we also were able to develop um, our statewide leadership team um, around infant mental health for the state and looking at the workforce and looking at um, how infant mental health can even further um, be recognized within the state. Um, and so there's been a lot of, ex of expansion as a result of, of not only the funding through COVID, um, but also uh, the movement and the innovation that is going on inside of Illinois. So Deborah, I, 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 I like, because I am writing things down. You use the same word that Nikki uses, a word opportunity. Mm -hmm. I used it in relation to COVID, which I think all of us are semi-comfortable saying, oh, cool, the right? But it was mm -hmm. that opportunity yeah. to sort of build and expand. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to just clarify one thing. I think you said, PFE funding. Is that what you said? PFE? PFE. <laughs> Preschool for all expansion funding. I just want to make sure for, for everybody there was a, a there's a question in that in there. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's a whole world of mental health consultation in the home visiting world in Illinois as well, is there not? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. And how's that connected? Are you part so, of connected in a different way? Connected in a different way through yeah. MACV. Right. Um, and yet it's a part of the leadership team um, that's currently um, working on behalf of consultation throughout the state in all of its forms. Yeah, I just I, I just wanted to make sure um, that folks knew, like, sometimes there's separate things going on. And uh, uh, several of you have mentioned Head Start, which obviously mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan of and has a requirement for mental health consultation but also just the ways in which you start to connect those dots and, and even Mary Margaret, who may I'll just come to you next because you mentioned the other work that's happening in Virginia. We had Kayla, Titus and friends talk yesterday in one of the sessions about Virginia's work. So um, Dallas, if it's okay, I'll go to Mary Margaret next. Yeah, thanks. Um, just to sort of keep building on these introductions, super helpful and we're getting lots of appreciation for the evolution stories that, that y'all are sharing. All right. Um, well, if it's OK, I'm going to start back in Louisiana and then come back to Virginia because um, and I'll share a little bit of my story, too, that goes into this journey that crosses state lines. Um, as I said, I'm trained as a pediatrician and child psychiatrist, so I've saw up close the opportunities of pediatric primary care as a place where children's health and well-being happens. And I also experienced as a pediatric resident that I didn't really learn that much about infant mental health in my pediatric training. And frankly, I didn't learn that much about infant and early childhood mental health in my child psychiatry training either. I did have to do um, some additional training and to understand the breadth of, of what we all think of as infant and early childhood mental health. Um, so I, my, my story and the story of the programs I'm connected to here really starts in Louisiana. I was lucky enough to train um, at Tulane where there's an enormous number of incredibly talented people um, 
probably this group is familiar with Allison Trigg and Angela Keys and Sherry Heller. Um, my uh, first step into pediatric primary care consultation came from adversity too. So I appreciate that that theme, but the oil spill of um, 2008 uh, resulted in some funding for children's well-being, and we were able to uh, get some funding to support a very small pediatric primary care consultation program in which we offered phone consultation uh, and in-person consultation to pediatricians um, and pediatric primary care clinicians uh, in the Gulf area. Um, our focus was both the, the pediatricians and also our trainees. We had psychology trainees and um, triple board trainees and psychiatry trainees. So really valuable um, opportunities to introduce, um, to make this model of care seem like part of what you're supposed to do um, <laughs> for, our, for our new colleagues and growing colleagues. Um, we, did, we primarily, we had some number of uh, practices that weren't that interested, but we made strong connections with a, family, with a federally qualified health center um, serving uh, kids in New Orleans and our training clinic for pediatric residents and continue to grow um, the work in both of those practices over a number of years. Um, we were, and we, we grew that, and I want to acknowledge, we grew that through a patchwork um, system of getting grants from wherever we could. Um, so two-year grants, small ones from philanthropic organizations primarily in the beginning um, to sustain that program. We were excited though to, um, to for that Louisiana um, through the Office of Public Health received a launch grant um, and we developed consultation then um, to primary care, um, early care and education and um, early intervention. And we really tried to think about it as a model of the same model with just some adjustments and tweaks to the to the model, the principles of infant and early childhood mental health, the principles of what children need and their caregivers need are universal. And so we we're adjusting the models. Um, and I was lucky to work again with Allison on that. Um, the probably the most in terms of evaluation of the, the, the information we got from that program that was most um, that resonated most was our partners telling us that they felt like they had more access to care, um, to mental health care. They actually felt like they had more access to therapy. Um, they told us that they had, um, that they felt more confident in what they were doing. And we had amazing uh, consultants doing that work, I should say. Um, we kept growing across the age span and um, uh, we're lucky enough to get the HRSA perinatal grant, which I think is the same as infant and early childhood mental health. Um, when I think about the target of care, the, the dyad, really different <laughs> in terms of the culture of obstetric practices compared to pediatric practices. Uh, and so we had to adjust and focus a lot more on education in that model. And, and um, the, the relationship building took more time. Um, Fast forward, to, I need to fast forward faster um, to Virginia. <laughs> um, the Louisiana work is ongoing and amazing people are doing it, but I did move to Virginia um, to this uh, children's hospital and medical school um, that had recently committed to children's mental health care and acknowledged that the needs of young children were particularly unmet. Um, we started again with a small philanthropic grant and worked only in our pediatric primary care clinic here in the hospital that serves as the continuity uh, clinic where residents learn how to take care of patients in pediatric primary care. Um, and with that, we were able to demonstrate um, significant patterns of utilization, even though we literally started the third, we're planning to start the third week of March uh, in 2020. <laughs> um, and had the seed funding that allowed us to get a much bigger grant um, to grow our team um, to this uh, transdisciplinary team, which is really exciting, that includes significant focus on care navigation and connecting families to resources in the community, um, but also is going to allow us to model out the impact of this teeny little program as if it could were disseminated. So um, we're working with some really smart data people who speak a different language. Um, uh, so. Work. I'm excited at being in Virginia, though, because uh, there is already momentum. There are already really um, extraordinary people 
advocating for the needs of young children. And so the potential for um, synergy across the, the models is really astounding. And the last thing I'll say about that is we have a statewide co um, consultation program for pediatricians to just call and ask about any mental health need. And that's a lot of your states probably have that. Um, mostly that's focused on medications and so not really relevant. So we've developed in Virginia VMAP a hub focused only on young children. So five days a week, people can call, pick up the phone, and pediatricians and pediatric primary care clinicians can ask us um, how to approach the needs of the young children they're seeing. Um, so really exciting potential synergy and energy, and I feel very lucky to be here. Awesome. Well, I, I again, I I really love, and we're hearing from in the comments about sort of the the story, the origin stories. And anybody who mentions Allison Trigg, of course, gets extra points, and apparently the free sweatshirts already spoken for. But also um, Sherry Heller and Angela Keys, who are, as everybody knows, part of our COE faculty and just tremendous assets for us. I, I like Mary Margaret that part of your story is about. Um, different dollars. So you mentioned LAUNCH, which is a SAMHSA, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, kindly funding our COE, but also a, a great program that I believe there's a LAUNCH grant that was in Illinois. There was a LAUNCH grant in Alabama. There was a LAUNCH grant in Arkansas, and there's a LAUNCH grant in Louisiana. So is it a coincidence that there are early childhood systems building grants where people are doing early childhood systems building and people take advantage? But you also mentioned HRSA. There are other federal partners, and Deborah mentioned McVie out of also out of HRSA, but ACF, which funds Head Start and Department of and obviously education, um, uh, lots of different federal dollars that flow down to states that people are able to access the philanthropic community that that sort of helped you. I, I love this idea of like the building, 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 um, and no one has of yet mentioned. Oh, this foundation gave us like $25 million and said, go, like, everybody is sort of taking piece by piece. Now, Dallas, you may wreck my story by saying every foundation in the world is giving you money, but, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. So I'm going to turn Dallas, uh, last but not least, sort of uh, a bit about the story of how you got here. And it's interesting, you know, I was going to tell you, Neil, to let Mary Margaret go ahead of me because all of these are building up to where we are because we did come after all three of these states um, and we did utilize the work that they had done already. You know, why recreate the wheel? Um, but <clears throat> just to kind of a, a little bit of background, um, right out of grad school, I ended up in Colorado for the first three years, straight out of grad school, wanting to know what this infant and early childhood mental health thing was all about and had determined that I would go and learn everything that I could about it and bring it back to Alabama. Little did the not so old or not so young old Padawan get called back for an interview in 2015 for the Project Launch Grant here. And um, I didn't feel like the interview went well, but I came armed with all the things that I knew that other states had done and how they did it. And I was like, you know, whoever you guys hire to help you do this, here's all the information you need. You can make it happen. See ya. Well, in the words of Lee Corso, not so fast, my friend. <laughs> so here I come back in my naivety thinking, oh, this is going to be challenging, but we have roadmaps. Well, roadmaps are just that. They're roadmaps and you can still get lost and you can still take a, a different turn and find yourself in a swamp, in the woods, you know, wallowing in the mud or of self-pity, you know, having to pick yourself back up and figure things out because each state is different. And um, our demographics are different. Our cultures are different. Um, you know, so we have to really think about those things. So in 2015, we did pilot mental health consultation through Project Launch in Tuscaloosa County was our pilot site. 
We piloted it in first class pre-K, home visiting, and early intervention. The two that stuck <laughs> were um, first class pre-K and early intervention. We made an attempt to pilot in early care settings. We just didn't get good solid footing with it during the launch grant. We didn't we were not able to get enough data to really tell us anything. However, we got about, uh, I got about 18 months into my work with them as the first mental health consultant in the state or designated identified consultant in the state. And all of the project launch partners, there was a lot of momentum and they wanted to keep this going. They wanted to find ways to expand and to capitalize or to leverage all of our relationships and our funding sources. And so it was decided they would move me to the state capital in Montgomery, where my position would have shared funding between the Department of Mental Health and Early Childhood Education to begin connecting the dots and building relationships. And that was midway through that grant. So at that point, we were strengthening relationships and we were looking for funding. We were looking for those people who wanted to invest. We were looking for our champions. And so once the grant ended, we had secured champions. And so the Department of uh, Human Resources, which is who our early care uh uh, early care centers fall under or licensed through, um, they were the first to fork out money to put mental health consultants uh, into the field across the state and uh, the Al Alabama Department of, I mean, Alabama Partnership for Children um, were the ones that secured that funding. And so what they decided to do was partner with community agencies um, to put to place the consultants within the communities. And so an example would be our ARC uh, agencies um, or I guess ARC, does everybody know what ARC is? Um, I can't think of the actual term for the ac acronym, um, but uh, let's see. Oh, okay. Anyway, community agencies. And so they would serve the licensed early care centers and um, they were able to do that. And during that time, we had a state legislator uh, from the Tuscaloosa uh, district whose constituents were filling his head with all these wonderful things that mental health consultants can do. And so he wanted to know all about this. And so we threw together this makeshift white paper and gave it to him in the middle of legislative session. And he just so happened to be chairman of the Ways and Means Committee and uh, said, how much do you need to get started? And they looked at me and I was like, oh gosh, I have no idea. I don't know, 500,000? I don't know, I should have asked for more. Um, that got us started because once that was secured as a line item, other agencies said, how much will it take to get one more, two more, three more? And so we were able to, because of that partnership, because of that relationship, we were able to secure more funding so that first class pre-K could have a mental health consultant for each region. Um, now, we also have a small group that's in Head Start, Early Head Start, like I mentioned before, but that's that's how we got started, and it grew really, really super fast, and um, we realized that we needed some type of guidance or committee or leadership team, and so we started forming a leadership team um, that is now comprised of multiple agencies, so um, it, it, of course, it's myself and um Jane Dewar, who represents um, early intervention from the Department of Mental Health, Sarah Ellen Thompson, who is at the Department of Mental Health, our um, established reflective supervision state coordinator, uh, Taisha Durr, and then also our um, uh, Beth Jones, who is the director for First Five Alabama Housed at Alabama Partnership for Children. And so as we're able to pull in folks into our leadership team and 
um, really focus on how to continue the work that we're doing and support all the pilots that we're doing. And we couldn't have done it without the work um, that was done by our predecessors, you know, um, in uh, Maryland, uh, Jordana Ash in Colorado, and of course in Louisiana um, with uh, Dr. Heller. I mean, when I got here and and they said, okay, Dallas, create a model for us. I picked up the phone and I called Jordana Ash and I said, help, 911. Who do I talk to? How do we get there? What do I do? And she said, call Sherry Heller. That's your reflective supervision person. She'll help you. And so we brought Sherry to the state like three years in a row to start a foundational work around reflective supervision for us. Um, and then Jordana just really guided along the way, along with Dr. Heller, um, on pieces of a model and taking what the other states had done and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work here. And yeah, a lot of barriers, um, a lot of challenges, um, but I use in a lot of trainings that I do, I uh, use a book called by Kobe Yamada entitled, What Do You Do With a Problem? A problem is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to do something different. It's an opportunity to make change. And so every challenge, every obstacle is an opportunity for us to shift our perspective and look at it at a different way and potentially pull in someone from another area and say, hey, take a look at this and help us figure it out together. The biggest piece to doing this work, in my opinion, are leveraging relationships. When you leverage relationships, and you strengthen those relationships, you leverage dollars. And we have shared funding with each other, which has built throughout our system in the state system of care. We've actually been able to reach out to other states for the work of um, workforce capacity building in other states, sharing our funding by opening up seats. Um, for training opportunities. And we've been able to do that throughout the Southern region. And it's just been a wonderful thing. And, you know, that's kind of our history in a nutshell. We couldn't have done the work without everybody else here laying the groundwork. And yes, Nikki, we looked at Project Play. We still look at Project Play. I mean, we have everybody's playbooks, literally on my bottom shelf down here in binders is every state's playbook. And sometimes when we get stuck, we pull out the playbooks and we go, what did, did this happen in another state? What did they do? And we, we really, you know, do value uh, all the work that's, that's gone before us to help us push ourselves forward in this work. I think that's true for all of us. I remember when we were trying to help uh, create a more cohesive model, you know, phone a friend, like connected with Deb Perry. She sent me to Jordana in Colorado. She sent me to the team in Louisiana, you know, and that learning is so important. Awesome. I see we've reached the stage where we're just name dropping left and right, which I really appreciate because now everybody's going to get calls. I also just want to point out, Lauren, that moving forward, I'd like to be referred to as an opportunity instead of a problem. I really like that. Thank you, Dallas. Uh, a couple of things that you sort of threw out there are actually consistent. We're going to take a few minutes here for, for some questions, comments from folks. I know that there's some in there, so I'm going to bring them to the attention of, of the panelists, but keep putting them in there. We're going to take a little bit of a, of a break from the um, uh, everybody has to tell a story. We'll come back. There's more to the story. But I thought, Dallas, that you talked about a number of things, and anybody who can start quickly with a Star Wars and a college game day reference and somehow get us back to um, mental health consultation is, is a superstar. But you talked about champions. And I also heard leadership team. And every single one of you didn't talk about I at all. You talked about who else and that partnership. And if mental health consultation is about anything, it's about relationships. And folks here are 
hearing over and over again and understanding. And some of those questions are about how, how did you do those things? So I'm going to come back. Let me just look through a couple of the questions here because um, there's a few that I think could be for, for all of you to, to sort of chew on a little bit. There was one question about cumulative list of all the programs, funding streams, things like that. Here's the good news. Uh, the Center of Excellence is partnering um, with the one of the Head Start TA centers, the Center on Health, Behavioral Health and Safety, and is gonna do a national scan of where mental health consultation is happening, who's the who are the champions within uh, states? We're going to do our best to get to um, uh, as many tribal nations as as we can, territories, and and come up with that sort of list. It's obviously a very dynamic list of who's doing mental health consultation, where there are statewide pieces. You've heard a, a mention of that, but I want to come to all of you with a, a couple of the questions. Um, one, Dallas, if you could just say the name of that book again, that is about um, me being an opportunity. I, I believe that it was is, the It is What Do You Do With a Problem by Kobe, K-O-B-I, Yamada. Thanks. So I, I'm going to come to a couple of questions because I thought some of these are very interesting. Um, and um, one was about sort of who's doing this work and sort of the, we talk a lot about licensed endorsed folks, um, but those might be folks who have lots of expertise in mental health, but maybe no classroom or home visiting experience or expertise at all. I've never been in a classroom. So how in your workforce development, and we may be shifting here just so you guys know into sort of part two, but I think it's, I think we're okay. Um, how have you sort of tried to, to get in terms of that workforce, folks who who maybe are not 100% schooled in the place where they're going. They may have the mental health expertise, but they don't have a lot of expertise in early care and education and early intervention or primary care. So who, who wants to sort of throw in on that? That's a great question. So in Illinois, um, through, the, through the Illinois model that was developed, uh, in collaboration with the statewide leadership team, um, what we settled upon was looking at those individuals who had training in um, early childhood, uh, whether it be a child life specialist, whether they've had a degree in early childhood, uh, working with children and families, um, and not necessarily so much focusing on them being licensed, um, we spend a lot of time providing professional development in this field of infant and early child mental health consultation. Uh, we also provide mentorship as well. Um, we have a registry um, through our through INCRA, and I'm not going to go into what those acronym, what that acronym thing means, um, but certainly uh, they help to provide a lot of PD as well as uh, caregiver connections um, for consultants. Um, and also, uh, we are huge reflective practitioners. And so all of those elements combined help to um, create consultants that we feel can match the needs of the field um, and not necessarily have to be licensed to do that. I'd like to say a couple things about how that works in Arkansas. Um, so one one piece, kind of speaking, um, Deborah, to the um, the aspects of the work that can be done by lots of, of folks with different kinds of expertise. We are lucky in our expulsion prevention system to have a partner group um, out of a state university that are technical assistance providers that take the majority of cases from our expulsion prevention system, and they have expertise that ranges from special education to, you know, social emotional specialists to inclusion specialists, and they are a brilliant team. And then that kind of frees up uh, sometimes our mental health consultant team to focus on cases where it feels like that clinical, more clinical expertise is particularly uh, beneficial. And so we have kept um, our mental health consultation team 
you know, the requirements are to be licensed or licensed eligible. And that is not to say that everyone's coming to us with the expertise that they need. Nobody's coming out of Arkansas grad schools with the expertise that they need to do to know everything about all aspects of mental health consultation. So we're training, you know, we, we train more than then you might need to train if you were in Michigan where, you know, endorsed people are floating around all over the place. Um, in my imagination, I don't know, is that true? Um, but yeah, so we do a lot more front end training about the world of child care, about, you know, infant mental health and child development, you know, and kind of, kind of all those, all those pieces. And I would say too, that the partnerships we have are so essential because I could never, we could never find the workforce that we need to meet the whole set of needs with, you know, through just our mental health consultation program. So partnering with others who are bringing their workforce to the table has been um, hugely important for us. And I didn't mention, we also have uh, Erickson that has a infant early child mental health uh, credential program, uh, certification program, as well as we have the Illinois credentialing. Mm -hmm. And it just provides a credential, not so much a license, but definitely providing more PD uh, within the field to further equip consultants. And I'm just guessing, I, I'd be interested just sort of building on this. So we have a broader question about the workforce that I think I may save for the, for the second part here. But um, when you first started, those of you who talked about your three pilot programs and things, you weren't doing the same sort of level of, of professional development, were you? You were just trying to get your, your program going, get some data so that you could, in Dallas's case, grab that legislator who happened to be a potential funder. You weren't worried. I, I guess I, I'm watching so many trials right now that I forgot to like, I'm leading the witness, but was, let me ask it a different way. What were you doing in terms of professional development when you were doing the pilot work? Was there You're any? right. It was much less well formed. And so yeah. we were working with community mental health centers and they were trying to find who's the one or two people in our system that know anything about young kids who've ever worked with young kids who've ever like walked into a child care program. And there were some people that had been partnering with Head Starts and kind of doing their own self-study and building their own skills. And so it took us a while in those pilots to figure out um, kind of what they were expressing is the gaps in their knowledge and just bringing speakers in and, you know, and then that led, of course, over a period of a number of years to us figuring out what, you know, a more coherent training approach needed to look like. No, that we took, um, you know, we didn't have a number of years, Nikki, <laughs> you know, it was like boots on the ground. We have to do something. What do we do? And uh, Jordana Ash was helpful in allowing us to use some of the surveys that she had used to help us gauge what the gaps. We could make an assumption of what the gaps were. We knew that reflective practice, or reflective supervision was definitely going to be a gap. We went ahead and planned for that. We knew that the knowledge of what infant and early childhood mental health consultation was going to be a gap. Um, we planned for that, but what were the other gaps? What were the other areas that we needed to focus on? And so we decided to focus on four primary areas. <clears throat> and it was really interesting when I got to Alabama, they were in year two of their grant. And after even going to zero to three and reading about consultation, they still didn't have a clear vision for what it was supposed to be. And so we created four learning mod modules is what we called them. And we did them in an order, the introduction to infant and early childhood mental health consultation. Um, oh my goodness, here I am. Now I'm not going to be able to think of all four of them. Anyway, introduction to consultation. There was the self-care uh, modules that were on the ECLIC website or the um, uh, the early mental health consultation website, Neil. Um, we used that. We modified it just a little bit. Um, we used that and we did uh, reflective practice. We didn't use the term supervision because that was a trigger for some people to have multiple supervisors. So we just called it reflective practice. Um, oh, and trauma-informed care. How could I forget that? <laughs> 
what is trauma-informed care? What is a trauma-informed approach? And so those were the four areas that we just kind of pounded with. So if that was part of the pilot, you got these models. Well, we did the surveys, you got these models, then, then we would give you mental health consultation. And then we used our measures there, our outcomes measures um, from that point. And then we would we would realize what did we need to come back to again um, and revisit with our uh, community sites within the county. So that was how we started um, to this day. We still use those modules um, and we revise them or, you know, update them for whatever the population is that we are speaking to or that we're training. But we went from that to um, we called on Cheryl Goldberg, another name drop, Cheryl Goldberg um, and Chris Watson in Michigan slash Minnesota to help us. Uh, really dig deeper for the consultants for, so the consultants could have workforce or capacity building within that group. And so they brought their home visiting model of infant mental health and adapted it to consultation for us. And we stuck with that. And then there was a lot of trial and error with other things. Um, you know, trying to introduce perinatal mental health uh, knowledge and skill set to the uh, consultants. Um, we tried several things. We use promoting first relationships, promoting um, uh, maternal mental health. And, and I think we landed with mothers and babies. That one stuck. That one was the one that was most accepted. Um, so we still use the Michigan model of infant mental health. We still use, we're using mothers and babies and we use Erickson's fan and we incorporate fan into every single thing we do. If we do leadership training, we incorporate fan. If we do coaches, everybody gets a piece of the fan. So those were the, the, after several years of trying different ways or ideas of educating and preparing our workforce to become mental health consultants, those were the things that we finally landed on. And I, I feel like those kind of have stuck, you know, so now we're working on, you know, outside of consultation on the clinical piece. What are the pieces missing? So, you know, child parent psychotherapy, circle of security, all those fun things. So that's kind of how we finally narrowed down what would work for our state. I, I, Alice, I, I just wanted to I, jump in and say, I'm so glad you mentioned the FAN because the facilitating attuned interactions model out of Erickson has we have incorporated that into our new consultant training as well. We have found that that helps consultants operationalize the consultative stance. Um, so that's just been a really helpful training addition for us and re recommend it. Well, I, I love how many things you've thrown out, how many people's names, not, not if, all of you, because I think that's one thing in this field that if you're trying to implement infant and early childhood mental health consultation, you're not alone. And I love that you talked about Jordana or Allison or, you know, very early on, you think about Liz Bissio and, and colleagues in, in Connecticut and Mary in Michigan and folks, you know, obviously Khadija out in San Francisco. These are folks who have always been willing to share and help so that all of you now who are listening are like, oh, I got to go talk to Dallas, right? That's the next group of people. This week, we've heard from other folks. Sam Juanita in that, in that plenary just it always hits me that there's people doing good work who are willing to go to other people and ask for help and also willing to share their expertise. All the things that worked for Dallas in Alabama, I don't know, maybe they're going to work for you. They're not what Mary Margaret maybe did in coming into Virginia. Some of those things did. So I do want to sort of shift here, um, although I do like Dallas, that you mentioned the ECMHC.org uh, e website. 
that was funded by the Office of Head Start. And it's such a great example of this work has been funded. We talked about Project Launch and the work that Jen Oppenheim and colleagues did in getting that going at, at SAMHSA. We've talked about SAMHSA. We've talked about HRSA. We've talked about the Office of Head Start and ACF. Department of Ed, people asked about. I heard a lot of you talk about your, your ed uh, colleagues in, in the state. So I think we'd be remiss though, and actually I believe one of you told me we better ask about this, the challenges, the places where you're like, oh, this is a dead end, or this is a cul-de-sac, maybe, right? Thinking about your book, Dallas, it's, it's just a cul-de-sac. A stop sign is really just guidance. It's not really the law. Like we just sort of cul-de-sac. That's... How did you go about doing this? What were some of the things, like the goodness of fit? How did you know I'm going to move into early intervention or I'm going to go to primary care? Where did you sort of be like, oh, we, oh that didn't work. So maybe just a few minutes, if you don't mind. We still got, yeah, we're good. And we'll come back to all of you in terms of um, um, your questions and comments. Nikki, just somebody has a question about the fan. So you want to give them just a... Um, exactly yes. what it is and who where it comes from so the folks can go look yes facilitating attuned interactions it's a training model and it's out of the erickson institute and there are now i think a number of articles you can find pretty easily if you if you google um it's it's wonderful great thanks so much so let's get to sort of the not so fun part when you went to a legislator and they're like no not happening or you went to a colleague or you sort of hit a bit of a, a bit of a challenge. What, what were some of the things that, that happened for you as you were building and developing? I don't know who wants to start. I can start with something that sort of lo also loops back to the other question of um, really, I think, developing cultural competence in the world that we go to serve in terms of consultation. <laughs> Um, and for us, that was, um, there were two times I can think of. One was when we got the um, BP oil spill grant, we were trying to serve a very large geographic area, part of which was um, down the bayou, which means a more rural and um, isolated area of Louisiana. And then the other part was New Orleans. Um, and the building connections with the pediatric primary care clinicians in um, in Homa in the area uh, that was uh, more rural took a lot more effort. Um, and there was cultural competence from the perspective of, I'm from New York City, uh, <laughs> let me be very clear. Um, so I'd already um, done a lot of learning uh, to be in Louisiana at all, but, um, understand is learning the culture of that community which was so different from new orleans um and then the second piece uh was geographic just the difference and this was in 2008 so we were using telehealth but not so much for consultation at that point and so the the challenges of just being there and getting there and that kind of thing so i think the um and it was uh, the new orleans pediatric community had asked for this and the um the Helma community had not really asked for it per se. And so we faced the challenge there. And um, I would say we didn't fully overcome it until, well, we didn't feel it, fully overcome it period. But I think our efforts were in building those relationships, doing a lot of knocking on the door, bringing cookies, those kinds of things. Uh, we did develop some swag uh, to leave at practices. Um, but those were, and then, and really just trying to understand the needs of those communities. I think the other um, uh, challenge that we faced when we um, started the perinatal work was that no one on our team uh, and our primary team was an OB. We had um, perinatal psychiatrists um, who worked very closely with OBs, but we didn't have um obstetric providers as part of our team. And so we had to build connections with that community through their professional organization, again, through knocking on doors and, and um, drinking coffee and such. Um, but the the I think that building relationship piece and understanding the that there is a geographic and community culture, but there's also professional cultures that we need to be connecting to. 
So Mary Margaret, aside from needing you to name drop pizza joints in New York City, I think you bring up this really important point, and it's an equity point, right, of how are we getting these services? And, and Deborah even said this in her introduction. In Chicago, well, not even rural area, but there is a part of that city that are sort of the haves with lots of resources and folks who don't have access to those resources. I'm looking at folks in Alabama, Virginia, Arkansas, where there, and, and Illinois, quite honestly, places where not only are there folks who may not have access, but didn't even necessarily ask. Like they don't even know necessarily to ask, but it's an equity issue. How do we, and this has been, you know, uh, our partners on the COE from the Children's Equity Project have been adamant that we need to do bi-directional TA. We need to be reaching out. So how have you all addressed, I'm going to sort of push a little bit because I think this is one of those perhaps challenge points for some of you. How have you ensured or attempted to ensure that you're getting this to folks who may not otherwise have access? I don't know if that's a fair question that I didn't tell you beforehand, but Mary Margaret brings up a really, I think, a critical piece around equity. Hold on, that was a so one of the things. One of the things that we're doing is that we've launched a public awareness campaign um, for um, infant and early child mental health consultation in the state um, through a series of one pagers in several different languages, as well as videos. And this is something we've done recently as a way of reaching out to uh, everyone, whether it be uh, uh, child care providers, families, uh, other leadership around the around uh, infant early child mental health consultation, but definitely around the need and how um, that need can be met. Mm -hmm. um, and it, in addition to that, also looking at how we can begin to create more integrated systems. And that's something that Illinois is beginning to work on and towards uh, through the Governor's Smart Start program. Um, for as innovative as Illinois is, we still struggle with siloism. Um, and so to that end, what we have come to realize by having these integrated systems, um, we're able to create and provide more resources in those places where resources are an issue. Um, we're also looking at community systems development and how that plays a role in being also connected to this uh, inter interconnection um, through the Smart Start program. Um, and how working in different regions of the state and levying uh, those providers in the state, but whether they be business owners, child care uh, owners, or just a, a resource in terms of uh, mental health, physical health, wherever the resource may be, how we bring them all to the table and create this one-stop kind of mindset. Yeah. Um, and, and so these are the things that we're beginning to work on. And, and in the interim, we're, we're still dealing with the realities of how do we keep reaching out? So uh, I have a- Oh, sorry. Beautiful. Sorry, thank you. I just, a follow-up, because I, you said public awareness, and I'm just wondering, is public aware, a public awareness campaign the same everywhere? Are there sort of efforts, and, and you may not be as far into it, Deborah, as, as to answer it, but just a thought around, what public awareness campaigns look like in different parts of, of a state or within a tribal nation or in a territory, how folks receive their information, what the information is, how we even talk about. I, I have been really appreciative of the plain language that y'all have used thus far. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes mm -hmm. we talk about this and in such, you know, the theoretical constructs behind mental health consultation are pretty highfalutin. I don't know. I like to use phrases from the 1920s, but I think that like they're, <laughs> they're complex. And if we don't use yeah. plain language, so in that public awareness campaign and the videos and stuff, are there folks from sort of all over the, the city, the state? What, what does that look like? And then I'll come, sorry, Nikki, I, I, I know you want to jump in. All of this, it's, it's, it's very much in plain language. And that was the whole goal behind it. Um, there is a diversity of people um, that are in those uh, uh, one pages, as well as um, the professionals themselves, as well as our governor um, is uh, featured in one of them. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so to that end, we real, you know, we realized the same things you did, Neil. How do we reach folk in ways that are understandable? And then also how do we reach them in the language that they speak? Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Sorry, Nikki, I, I, I know you want to jump in. I, think no, I just wanted to make a plug for how smart policy can help here. So in mm-hmm. our state, um, our uh, Office of Early Childhood has a policy that funded programs, so state pre-K programs accepting vouchers, and of course Head Starts have their own rules, but funded programs shouldn't be suspending or expelling children without first contacting the state and letting the, the state know that they're struggling, which gets gets the issue on the table, and then the state has a coordinated approach to you know, contacting that program, interviewing to learn more about the needs and assigning either a technical assistance provider or a mental health consultant to address the need. And so I think smart policy can help both build awareness and help us know where the needs are. And then when we've got all of our resources connected and partnering to be deployed as the response, then then that's been super helpful for us. I, I love it, Nikki. And I want I want to hear from you if when you started and I think pushed your way in from evaluation into a moment, right? Were you a big policy person? Were you doing lots of policy work at that point in your career? Or is this, again, another example of where I think the evolution of where folks get in to where they go. So it's, again, a leading question, but you weren't doing thinking even about policy at that point, were you? No, no, we weren't. But um, we from the beginning, though, we had folks uh, working in policy in different sectors involved with the startup. So there was someone from the behavioral health side, someone from the Head Start Collab office, someone from the early childhood side, um, later someone from the child welfare side, kind of sitting in and help shaping the development of things. And then, you know, as opportunities present themselves, as folks have been talking about, now there's an opportunity either for funding with something like Project Launch or a preschool development grant, or we've even had disaster funding or, you know, all the things or as a work group gets started um, on the, I mean, we're a small state, you know, you're going to sit on a lot of committees, take advantage of every work group, every strategic planning effort that's happening in the state, you know, that touches early childhood, you just get at that table. And mm-hmm. that, you know, th- that has led to policy work and many opportunities. And so I do encourage folks to spend their time, you know, it can be hard to say, oh, okay, another strategic planning initiative or another early childhood work group or, but it's been so worth that, that policy energy. Yeah. And I love Nikki, the way that you framed it, like from, from one table to the next, right. Again, as somebody who oftentimes has to sit at the, at the children's table, um, getting to different tables is really important for us and having those conversations uh, questions have been in there um, around lots of different ways in which you all have made your connections. I don't want to. Uh, I want to make sure Mary Margaret and 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 Dallas have a just a chance, and we're going to come back to. There's really good questions coming in. We'll we'll get to to as many as we can in just a few minutes. But challenges are sort of. Um, I'm sorry. Opportunities that you've. Uh, so I'm learning. It, it 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 takes me a while, as you know, Dallas. But eventually, I can learn. What were some of those opportunities that came out of? Um, what you first initially encountered as a, a bit of a, a roadblock challenge, however you want to put it. For Alabama, I think, if I'm not mistaken, 57 out of our 67 counties are considered rural. And so finding the workforce uh, was interesting. And so... You know, while one school of thought says they must, consultants must be licensed, another school of thought says not necessarily. Um, We can um, work within each other and share knowledge and teach each other skill sets so that we are equal in the delivery of consultation. And our goal is to deliver it Uh, utilizing the same model as our foundation. And so we do have our early care consultants don't have to be licensed. However, the consultants that serve first class pre-K 
are employed through the Department of Mental Health. And in order for them to obtain a certain pay grade um, as a motivation to fill those seats or to fill those positions, they must be licensed. And so then in lies a pay disparity. And so that is a struggle that we are working through and trying to find ways to deal with that. Also, because of the rural nature of the state um, and having so few consultants, I say so few, we have more than we had, um, we tend to each year have hot pockets or across the state. And this year is no different. And our two hot pocket pockets center are right around the center of the state this year. And our two consultants who uh, mental health, Department of Mental Health consultants and our early care consultants became so overwhelmed that we had to figure out how to get reinforcements in there that was also cost effective because budgets are limiting and they're going to become even more limiting in the days to come, I'm afraid. So we've had to shift our thinking and how we deliver uh, consultation services. And what do we consider a touch point? We moved from visits to touch points. How do we touch this request? So we can touch this child through the teacher. We can touch this child through a parent. In Alabama, we have the first class pre-K that I've mentioned before, which is heavily resourced. It's an anomaly. So when I say heavily resourced, every, our, we're broken up into eight regions. Each region has a region director, a slew of coaches, monitors, and uh, the coaches have mentor coaches. And so we had to figure out where does mental health consultation even fit? Because in addition to that, we had a team that focused on intensive developmentally appropriate practice support for teachers, especially new teachers. And we call them connect. And so there was a lot of back and forth. How do, how do we make it work together? How can we be collaborative? There's enough work out there for everybody. How do we define what constitutes a need for mental health? consultation in that particular setting uh, versus te intensive teacher support. And I think we've gotten to the point where we've fine-tuned that piece um, and has resulted in this year, we've had by October 1, we had the same number of requests for help as we had on May 1st at the end of the last school year by October 1, so we are overwhelmed. Now, that way of doing things doesn't work in early intervention. And so uh, in early intervention, we had to, in the pilots, you know, the two consultants that piloted it had to figure out what was gonna work and what wasn't gonna work. What works for EI here is support of the EI provider and the service coordinator and providing office hours for them, providing a lot of phone calls. There's a lot of touch points that's done by phone. And so we, you know, figuring that out, we get into the substance, special women's substance use disorder programs. One was a bust. It was a bust because of staff turnover. And we just could not, we couldn't figure that one out had to put it to the side. But as we put it to the side, another one rose up and said, hey, we'll take you. <laughs> we'll take you. Okay, well, let's try it again and let's see what it looks like. And it was 10 times the size of the other one. And so again, we thought, well, they're under-resourced. We don't have enough resources capacity to help everybody with everything, but we do have a partner. We have the Connect team. And they volunteered on their off hours to help us get started at Love Lady Center here in Alabama. And so as we've worked with Love Lady, we're finding out that it's going to take a hybrid model of ways of being with consultation. There is consultation going on, but they need so much more. 
And so now that consultant is being trained in child parent psychotherapy. So that consultant can wear two hats within that particular situation. And so those are the thing, though, that's an opportunity. That's a great problem to have, right? And we have the funding to train this person in child parent psychotherapy. So why not? You know, some people will say, no, you can't do that. That that's not fidelity to the model. Okay, well, what is fidelity, really? And fidelity is someone's fidelity actually equitable to everyone. And if we're going to be equitable, we really have to look at that setting from the perspective of the people who are living, breathing, eating in that setting. And that's the approach that we have to take. And so that's why problems are not problems. They're opportunities for us to shift the way we think about that particular population or uh, area. Great. Uh, I mean, I stopped listening once you said the word hot pockets. I got super excited because uh, it's lunchtime. No, I'm just joking. So I think this is good. We have a few minutes left. And so, uh, you know, one question that came in, there's a lot of great questions. And folks, if we haven't gotten to your question, uh, I apologize. It's mostly uh, my fault because I just... Uh, we have folks who have so much to share. I think there's also opportunity here to keep using that word for you to follow up with somebody. You can obviously follow up with folks at our center of excellence. That's what we're here for to do TA, but you, you have some specific questions, but the question that came in that I want you to think about, Mary Mar, we didn't get to you as much in this last part. So maybe you start was around um, hopes and dreams for infant and early childhood mental health consultation moving forward? What? That's a, that's a big loaded sort of question. Um, but I'm wondering how, and, and my words, you don't have to, but I, I just want to give you the first opportunity. So I only have two minutes. Um, in, a, in a few words, what, what are some of the hopes and dreams for the cool. theme? That's what we're trying to work on here. Love that question. <laughs> um, well, to me, one, there, there are a couple of pieces, but um, the really big one for me is that infant and early child mental health consultation becomes part of the system rather than an outside piece. And so the whole system of care, and I think that's what Dallas is talking about, is kids need direct service too. Not everyone can only be, uh, not everyone's needs can solely be met by consultation. So consultation in my dream world is part of a full continuum of care that starts with prevention and starts prenatally and goes through this um, higher, the more definitive evidence-based direct one-on-one -on -one kinds of treatments uh, that we also know work and are needed for some kids. Uh, and to be part of that system of care, then there's a system of, um, of payment um, that is doesn't require us to put the patchwork <laughs> grants together and uh, make relationships are great, but maybe we wouldn't need 15 different agencies to support <laughs> the program. Um, but really, I think being part of a, a organized system of care where families do understand the value would be a short version of my dream. Great. Anyone else? I want to credit Dallas for having inspired a new dream for me when I visited with her, I don't know, a year or two ago. I started my career in a specialized substance abuse treatment program for pregnant and parenting women. And so having seen that mental health consultation can happen in that setting, that has inspired a new dream for me. But I'm also going to adopt Mary Margaret's dream. That was good. 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 Medicaid, Medicaid, Medicaid. No pressure. No pressure. No. Our Medicaid, we have a Medicaid policy team here, and our Medicaid team is fully on board to helping us realize this dream and figuring it out. And that has been great. Deborah? Yeah, I, I have to share Mary Margaret. It's, it's one coordinated system and one coordinated funding um, and a steady and a really intentional approach to higher learning um, to begin to look at. Um, cranking out more consultants from that from that vantage point. We're at time. I'll I'll end by saying this. I love you guys. You're just you're so giving of your time, of your knowledge, also crediting so many other folks who've come before, who are your compatriots now, who are moving us forward, right? We're trying to we're talking about growth and advancement in this field. 
I, I really appreciate you giving your, your time today. I hope that folks have gotten from this sort of those implementation strategies, the, the ups and downs, the opportunities that come from roadblocks and things like that. Um, some inspiration. I, I certainly feel these three days and this plenary in particular give me a lot of a lot of hope and inspiration for where our field is and where it's going. So thank you all so much. Thank all of you who've attended, who've thrown such great questions in there. Again, if we haven't gotten to all them, uh, we are here and so are our folks. So, you know, make those connections, keep those networks going. Uh, thanks again. And we have a little break here and then on with the rest of the of, of, of our conference today. Thanks all.